Queen Elizabeth II. This is why we all love her. The Noble One. Why do we love the Queen so much? Some people don't. There are others who believe we shouldn't have a monarchy and who object to anyone having such wealth and advantages just because of their bloodline. Yet the British royal family really generates far more cash than they use. So what if a few people wind up in palaces? It's always been this way. In addition, a lot of people who are completely opposed to the idea of a monarchy yet tend to love the Queen herself, which returns us to the initial query. Why? Because she is so noble, I suppose. We may not give dignity much credit these days, but when we think of the Queen, we feel a strong draw toward what it stands for. She exudes grace and is obedient, cheerful, and unruffled. She certainly has personality, in fact, she works in public as something bigger than herself, which is quite an accomplishment in today's self-culture. She is a human creature, of course, as we saw in the Anus Horribilis so many years ago, but for the average person, she is just the Queen, and there is something in our British spirits that admires and even requires that. We adore her, we respect her, but probably most of all, we are proud of her. Queens have traditionally ruled England. Although when we had kings, there were still queens, and even though Elizabeth II is the current monarch, according to our contemporary constitution, she primarily conducts herself more like a queen consort would have done historically not so much to lead as to embody leadership. Why is today's queen in place if she rarely actually exercises her regal authority? She serves as a reminder of our history, the public face of our country, and a role model for the rest of us not because she is fundamentally superior to us, but rather because she represents us. She embodies us in many ways, especially our best qualities. Her reign. Queens have therefore always existed. Lining along the streets to catch a sight of a royal procession, such as one carrying a monarch in a golden chariot or a bride dressed in regal accoutrements, is nothing new. We have been doing it since the dawn of civilization. Early in the 11th century, Edward the Confessor popularized crown wearings to jazz up the traditional celebrations of Easter, Whitsun, and Christmas. He physically appeared before his people wearing his crown and another royal regalia, and as the court was itinerant, this was in several locations Easter at Winchester, Whitsun at Westminster, and Christmas at Gloucester. It was a very well-liked method of fostering self-assurance and enabling the populace to partake in the inherited wealth and honor of the country. The Royals was a popular production in an era before there was such a thing as modern theater, and it is still popular now. Edith of Wessex reigned 950 years ago at the start of the year 1066, at the beginning of what would turn out to be just a nine-month rule, cruelly cut short at Hastings with significant repercussions for England. She processed around London with her husband, King Harold, just as Elizabeth I, I would process on Castle Hill today. Harold wanted Edith to help keep the North loyal against invaders because her brothers ruled the Mercia Midlands and Northumbria. Even though they ultimately were unable to repel the invaders, she managed to keep them loyal. However, those invaders also had queens. Later in 1066, Matilda of Flanders, the wife of William the Conqueror and an ancestor of Alfred the Great, became our queen. She would rule with him for 16 years, and two of her sons would follow them in the throne, continuing her genealogy far down the royal line for generations to come. And there is another character in the 1066 tale who, although coming very near to becoming our queen, very, very few of us are even aware of. Harald Hardrada's bride, Elizaveta of Kiev, became the queen of Norway as a result. When Harald led 300 ships of Viking invaders into the north in 1066, she was on the Orkney Islands. Hardrada was only beaten by Harald of Wessex at Stamford Bridge against all odds, thanks to a miracle of bad luck and bravery. Had he not been, he would have had little trouble ascending to the throne, just as Nut had done in 1016. Elizaveta would have been our queen if that had happened. She would have been a formidable and exotic addition to the Saxon throne as well given that she had brothers who were kings of Russia, Poland, and Byzantium, and sisters who were queens in France and Hungary. Who knows what kind of Britain we would live in now if we were Norse royals instead of Norman ones, but that is just conjecture. After Hardrada died, Elizaveta fled to Scandinavia, and it appears that Edith, Harold's widow, may have done the same. 
After Matilda was crowned queen, the populace eventually came to respect and appreciate her. In actuality, the dramatic events of 1066 probably had relatively little effect on the daily lives of many common men and women apart from those in the rebellious north. They cherished their offspring and brought in the harvest, and when given the opportunity, they would ogle the queen's lovely gowns, elegant vehicles, and shining crowns. She was after all there, as she is today, to shine as a symbol of their country, of which they were, like we are, proud. The Remarkable Queen Queen Elizabeth II belongs to the elite group of monarchs simply by virtue of her longevity. She had been queening for 70 years when she passed away today at Balmoral Castle, making her the monarch who had reigned the longest over the 1,000-year history of the English monarchy. However, it is not just her longevity that distinguishes her as a remarkable person. It is also her capacity to remain relevant as the world altered all around her. Despite being a descendant, she was more well-liked than any of her prime ministers and was able to maintain her position as head of state in many different nations because to public support. She was in some ways a democratic monarch, a progressive conservative, and a cosmopolitan aristocrat. Queen Elizabeth served an ever-changing combination of territories, peoples, institutions, and ideals that were no longer as manifestly compatible as they had been when she got to the throne. She was a constitutional queen, not a political leader with actual power. The queen's greatest accomplishment was upholding the promise she made to an imperial nation and its empire when she was a princess, even as it evolved into a multi-ethnic state and the Commonwealth. Her royal words. The Queen meant it when she said she would spend the rest of her life serving Britain's great imperial family. She also did it in a way that promoted harmony rather than discord. The globe loved her despite the decline in the influence of her country. She made a radio broadcast on her 21st birthday that would change the course of her life. She asked for their permission to speak on their behalf, addressing the peoples of the British Commonwealth and Empire in particular the youth of the British family of nations. This telegram, which was sent from Cape Town, South Africa, was intended for the waning empire rather than for England, Britain, or even the United Kingdom. The message was intended to start a transition as well as to encourage. The princess proclaimed that the British Empire had protected the globe from Hitler in the 20th century just as England had saved Europe from Napoleonic dominance in the 19th. She explained that the empire's current duty was equally urgent. It needed to save itself. Elizabeth claimed that if we all move forward in unison with firm faith, great courage, and a serene heart, we would be able to transform this historic commonwealth, which we all adore so dearly, into something even more magnificent. In doing so, the princess had given the British commonwealth a relatively modern structure, the myth of having ancient origins through political deception. She said, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Such a pledge may still be made in 1947 without causing any embarrassment. India, the crown jewel of the British Empire, had not yet achieved formal independence, though the legal process was ongoing and independence would soon become reality. Like this, the remaining threads of the royalties to Ireland had not yet been severed. But this supposedly old family will soon experience a revolution. Her legacy. In some ways, Queen Elizabeth II's legacy is murky. She is the monarch who stands above virtually all other British monarchs, yet she was also the one who experienced a sharp decline in the monarchy's prestige, power, and influence. However, such a legacy does not do the Queen honor. In 2016, then you, that's President Barack Obama attended Shimon Peres' burial. President Barack Obama, whose father was a Kenyan government official born in what was then part of the British Empire, compared him to some of the other titans of the 20th century naming Nelson Mandela and Queen Elizabeth II. She did not think the Queen's involvement in the Commonwealth was a cover for the reality of the British Empire's decline. 
Ironically, she was better suited to represent a contemporary, multicultural Britain and the world of the 21st century than logic might say was feasible for an aristocratic European princess by performing her duties to this imperial shadow. In the same manner, she performed her duties to Britain. She is currently more well-liked than the old white dominions, which may soon decide to become republics, and long since stopped viewing themselves as British in many African Commonwealth nations. But her parsing has left some feeling uneasy. Charles, her oldest child, appears an unusual representative of the British Shintoism that developed around his mother. Whatever his virtues, it seems hard to recreate the kind of adoration that the Queen attracted because of the way he has spent his life in the spotlight of the modern world, with Diana and Camilla, the Crown, and the tabloids. The Queen of the World Looking back on her reign, it is evident that Elizabeth's was a truly golden era marked by exceptional wealth, European peace, the advancement of human rights, and the fall of Soviet tyranny. Even though she was neither its originator nor its ruler, Queen Elizabeth II the Queen was one of that era's great emblems. But if her legacy has taught us anything, it is that symbols and service are still important even when the things they stand for and serve flex and adjust to the new circumstances.